Okay, welcome along. If you just want to grab your seats, if you did make that late dash to the bar, that would be appreciated. And also a big welcome to everyone who's tuning in and watching us via our YouTube channel. Great to have you with us this evening. For those of you in the room, just a reminder to either turn off your mobiles or leave them on silent. Toilets are at the back there if you do need to use them. Um, we'll be doing a raffle at the end for a signed QPR ball as well as a voucher for two spaces in the corner lounge for a fixture this season. So that will be taking place at the end. Just to quickly go through who's in attendance this evening, we have 40% loyalty points, our top loyalty points holders, 10% of fan sites, reps, and 50% are those season ticket holders or members who registered an interest in being here this evening. So thanks very much for coming out tonight to be with us. Um, the topics we're going to be discussing are the ownership and board, stadium update, recruitment, development squad and academy, on-pitch matters, catering as well, and then we'll open the floor for you guys to have your questions as well. Um, if you do have a question, just wait for the microphone to reach you. Again, it's not so much for people in this room, but people watching on the stream who, who want to uh, know, obviously, what's being asked, etc. So if you can just be patient and wait for the mics to reach you, that would be great. Okay, we'll just now introduce our four panellists into the room. We'll start firstly with QPR CEO Lee Hoos. Okay, thank you very much, Lee. Next up, QPR head coach, Gareth Ainsworth. And this evening, we're delighted to be joined by two of our co-owners. First, Chairman Amit Battier. Thanks, Amit. And also... Our Vice Chairman, Ruben Nanningham. Okay, as I've said, there are a whole host of questions and topics, so we'll go through them to make sure all areas are covered. Then we'll open for questions from the floor. Firstly, um, I'll come to you, Amit, and you're here at the Fans Forum this evening. Why were you keen to participate in this Fans Forum tonight? Um, can I be heard? Is it yeah. working? Hi. Um, hello, everybody. First of all, uh, it's nice to see you all. Uh, Paul, to answer your question, um, 17 years ago, when I first got involved in the club, I used to attend every fans forum. And then, uh, and I really enjoyed it, to be honest. It was really uh, a fantastic way to exchange ideas, to discuss things that were on people's minds. Um, and I think we did a lot of it. Uh, and uh, whilst I haven't sat up here as a panelist in the previous ones, I've been in the crowd in all, in, in, in all of them. Um, and so uh, I'm super excited to be back, super excited to take some questions, uh, answer any th questions, thoughts, queries that people have. Um, uh, and as I say, it's something that I've really enjoyed doing in the past and really looking forward to doing it again this evening uh, with all of you at a very opportune time when obviously there are a lot of questions, uh, totally aware of that. and so. Uh, very much looking forward to sharing a lot of thoughts this evening. Great stuff. Great to have you with us. And coming to you, Ruben, as well, that importance that Amit's alluded to there in terms of answering questions, transparency. Why is that so important to you at, at this moment in time? Well, I think it's not just at this moment in time. I think we've always tried to be as transparent as we can when it makes sense to be transparent. Um, I've, I've actually, I've been wanting to come for a while now, but my, my travel schedule just hasn't allowed us. I think... We tried over the last three years, but you know, especially during COVID, after COVID, and um, this is the first time that I'm actually here doing one of these, so that's why I'm actually happy to be here. Great stuff, and great to have you with us. And Lee and Gareth, you've had plenty of questions from me over the, over the years for both of you, so we'll crack straight on with the questions that we've received um, from supporters this evening for tonight's Fans Forum. And Amit, I'm going to come straight to you with a question from Simon Matthews. Um, why is it that the club chairman, Amit Batia very rarely attends home games? Surely he should be at every match. I've started with a nice, easy loosener. <laughs> <laughs> um, the answer to the question is that, uh, that's, that's, is that the facts are, are different than that. Um, I am, first and foremost, and I think all of you know that because I've gotten to know many of you over... Um, the last 17 years. Let me remind you, I have three children. They're 14, 13, and 10, and my involvement in QPR is 17 years. So um, this is as important a part of my life as, as anything else is. <coughs> and I'm a fan first, 
this is my local club. I live 12 minutes away from here. And I love coming to every game that I can possibly attend. Uh, there is no, no, there is nothing that gives me more joy. Uh, and there is, there is nowhere that I have better memories than I have here at Loftus Road. Uh, the answer is that I attend every single match that I can when I'm in the country. Uh, like Ruben, I tend to travel a lot. But when I'm in town, I attend uh, almost uh, every match that I can. Uh, what perhaps people don't know is that out sometimes I sit upstairs, but sometimes because I have a young family, uh, I sit downstairs uh, in uh, one of the boxes uh, to watch the game. So if you can please tell Simon that I attend all of the games, <laughs> but I'm just not always visible at all the games, but I've made it after I... <laughs> Now that I know that, I plan to wear a big white mink coat. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put on a pink hat, and I'll make sure he can see me when I'm there. But I, I love it. I'm there at all of the home games. I, wouldn't, I couldn't think of anything better to do, um, and I'm sorry that he doesn't always see me. Great stuff. Thanks, Amit. Um, coming to you, Ruben, um, this is a question from Niels Reynolds. The owners are collectively bailing the club out to the tune of around £24 million each year. Why do they do it? Is it love of football? Altruism, does owning the club indirectly promote their other business interests? Are there tax advantages for other businesses? Or is it the thought that we might make it back to the Premier League, hopefully stabilise, and then the club could become a realistic earner? The simple answer is that we're nuts, and that's probably why we do it. <laughs> um, but I, I think, you know, I got asked this question by, by the uh, staff last year when we did a review with everyone. and. Um, well, for me, especially for me, I think, you know, um, I, 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 w when, I, when I came to the club, I want to make sure the club leaves in a better place than when I first found it, right? So, so that, that's, I think, one of my key goals. And I have lots of unfinished business that I want to achieve here, and I think there's lots more we can still do as well. And, and, and that's why I still do it. And, and one of the key things, like Amit, I mean, my, my three kids are fans, uh, biggest fans that, that I know. And, and I want to make sure that I, I have something successful that they can actually be proud of too. And I'll be more proud of, I think, you know. So, so I think that's one of the key reasons I do it. I, I love football and, I, and, you know, sometimes in the past I have invested in other clubs where it's just an investment. And I think this one, you know, fortunately, unfortunately for me, it's not just an investment. It's actually something we love and, and as a family. And, and why I would not walk away um, and I think that, that probably, you know, leads to other questions that might come up later is, is because I, I don't want to let anybody down, right? And I think um, for me, this is not just for my family, but for the whole rural community here. I think we want to make sure that we leave the club in a very good place, um, even after we're gone one of these days. So, so for us, it's a, it's a long journey forward. And I think we want to be part of that journey as long as we can and make, to make sure the club is sustainable in the long term. Paul, can I just jump in one quick second? There are two bits of that question that I think it's important to address. One was, I think you ended up with saying, is there a tax advantage? Uh, there are geographies in the world, such as the United States, where people offset sports losses against their taxes. That is not the case in the UK. So it's a fair question to ask, because it happens in other places. It's not the case here. Um, in terms of uh, other businesses, uh, I can tell you for myself that there has never been a business that I've been involved in thus far that ha we've either used the club to advertise or in, in any way try to promote. QPR in itself is done out of the love for this football club, out of, to Ruben's point, out of a real desire as fans to try to bring success to this football club because we understand and know what it means to the fans, what it means to this community, um, about how we are a tribe at this football club, um, how it's okay to be different. Um, uh, and I'm sure many of our family members and kids uh, are probably questioning why they support this uh, our club. But when you've <laughs> been on this, uh, it's true though, isn't it? <laughs> but when you've been on this journey long enough, you fall madly and deeply in love with this football club. And that is the reason that uh, we do what we do, or that's the, p that's the motivation and the goal of trying to make sure that the club is improved. To Ruben's point, success is, are you leaving something better off than you found it? The club is 125 years old plus. Um, I know that 
and it's going to come up, so I'm just going to address it. I know we've won one in 18 at home, but in the long history of the club, if we can eventually leave the club better off than we found it, that is the desire and that is the goal. Nothing else, not personal gain, not tax advantages, not advertising other businesses. That's not the motivation here at all. And if you, if you ask me whether it's helped uh, my other businesses, I think it's actually done the opposite. Because people... <laughs> Because I think people start questioning my business acumen, when, <laughs> you know, when I'm invested here. So. By the way, he's not lying, and I'll tell you an anecdote. I'll tell you an anecdote. Ruben's company is a business called West Sports. His family jokes that he may have by mistake heard that his business is West Sports, <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> okay, and Amit, just sticking with you for a moment, a question from question from Connor Wells. I wish to ask whether the current owners do remain committed to the football club. You've answered that, but in particular, in light of speculation in the media that they are seeking investment into the club, does this indicate that they are willing to consider a full or partial sale of the club, or could it be both? Yeah, it's a very fair question. Uh, so the answer to the first part is that the commitment is absolutely there. Uh, our desire, as we keep saying, is to try to return QPR to its glory days. There's no doubt about that. That's what drives us all. That's the passion, that's the motivation. So for as long as we are welcomed here, as long as people think that we are doing our best in order to try to move the club forwards, I, I've never ever heard once from any of my, my partners or anybody that uh, our intention would be to move on or to exit. So short answer, we're here for the long term. The other part of it, yes, I think that with most situations, you have to sit back and reevaluate and realize how how can we bring more success? And if the answer to that is that we could bring somebody on board that enhanced the club in one of three ways. Number one, that person would have to have the same values that we have. But number two, either the person strategically helps the club move forward in a certain way, or finally helps the club commercially move forward in a certain way that we haven't been able to help the club to do then we would be silly to not give the club that opportunity. This is not about exiting. This is not about taking money off the table. This is about bringing somebody in if we found such a person who shared our values, who could either strategically enhance the club or commercially enhance the club. If somebody could do that, we should have those discussions and we should see whether or not that adds more value to the football club. It's definitely not about the person with the deepest pockets because that's not how football works anymore. If Elon Musk wanted to come and invest in QPR tomorrow, he can't come in and put $100 million in the club. It's just not how FFP works, PNS works, and I think we'll talk about all of that this evening. But it's not about how much money does somebody have and they're willing to put into the football club. You have to govern by certain rules and certain guidelines. And so within that framework, if somebody with the right values came in and said, we can unlock value at QPR doing certain things commercially, otherwise we would absolutely have those discussions and we'd see if that could enhance the football club going forwards. Thanks, Amit. Lee's just shaking his head at me. I don't want to discuss FFP again. If anybody wants to ask me any questions about PNS that, that I haven't covered over the last nine years, someone's going to need to bring me a drink from the bar <laughs> before I answer it. And a question for you, Lee, from Charlie Barrett. Can you explain... Uh, no. Is there, a plan <laughs> is there a plan in place where the board discontinue to put money into the club, and what does that look like? <laughs> well, it looks primarily like my resignation, but <laughs> the board, is, as, as I think has already been indicated, um, the, the, board, the, the club is not a going concern without the board. Okay, So if ever there came a time, and there has never, ever been any indication whatsoever that, that, that um, they would not put money into the club, um, you know, we, we would be insolvent, point blank. That's, that's the way it is. You know, I, I can remember a couple of years ago, somebody asking me, saying, you know, oh, man, I bet, I bet this is the most stressful job you've ever had. Said, no, it's probably one of the hardest working jobs I've ever had, but I've, I've actually not had a lot of stress. Stress is when you say, if you don't sell Gareth Bale in the summer transfer window, we're out of business by December. That stress when you know when you walk through the office and you see all those people that you think these people you know have bills to pay you know fan, we've got the fans we've got the, the that, that that's stressful that's sleepless nights, but here we, we've we've got a board that's been great that's um this is the only club I know of one that I've ever worked at and two that I know of that I never get chasers from people about late payments, 
everything is done on time, everything is, is, is proactive, everything is done above board. It's extremely well run from a financial standpoint in terms of making sure the cash is there when it needs to be there. So that's, um, that's, that's, that's what that looks like right now in terms of um, putting money in. Okay, and uh, we will move into other areas, just a, a couple more with regards to the board, etc. And it's a question from QPR Report, and it is to Amit, who now owns Tony Fernandez shares? So, uh, is Rich Riley in the room? Where is Rich? He's at the back. He's just put his hand up and, and waved. He's trying to stay and he very incognito. quickly sat down. Rich, just stand up so everybody can see you for a quick second. So, for those of you who don't know, Rich Riley there is, uh, is one of the directors and an owner in QPR now. Rich joined the board last year. Uh, he's promised that from next time he's going to sit up here and do the panel all by himself. <laughs> <laughs> but he's not quite ready just yet. Um, so the answer is that Tony's shares were bought by Rich, myself, and Ruben. Okay, great. And Richard said it's great being incognito because you can go to certain areas of the stadium and just see how it operates. <laughs> I think your cover's blown, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and a question coming to you, Leah, isn't with regards to FFP. It is actually with regards to um, salary cap management protocol. So... As you are very well aware, should we be relegated from the championship, the current profitability and sustainability regulations would no longer apply. Instead, we would be subject to the salary cap management protocol. Could you explain what this means in terms of QPR and whether we would have more flexibility to invest into the squad compared to the current roles? It's an interesting business plan he's going for. That is a very well-researched question, I have to say. Um, someone's done their homework. It's absolutely correct. Um, PNS is is only applicable. I said I wouldn't talk. So, Webby, Webby, where's that drink from the bar? We, we, we said PNS. That should be a drink. Um, only applicable to the championship. It's its own peculiar set of rules. We can use 39 million over the three years, which I think we, we, we all know about that. Um, obviously, our FFP fine has nothing to do with the current rules. Those current rules apply to everybody. It was done to align with the Premier League, who also have their own set of, of, of PNS rules. So our, our, the championship rules mirror the, the, the Premier League rules. However, Leagues 1 and 2 have their own rules, which is, as that question indicated, um, SCMP, Salary Cost Management Protocol. That works is, you, um, it's different. You have a lot more um, uh, um, um, ability to spend more money, believe it or not, in League One and League Two, because you can spend, which you know, you, you can you can spend in excess of, of, of the losses, but as long as you put um, equity in to cover that, then you're allowed to do that. So that's the, the key difference between SCMP. So you know, when we got fined the first time around, that was one of the peculiar things. If, if um, you know, ten years ago, twelve years ago, whatever it was, that had happened in League One and League Two, we'd have been absolutely fine. It was only the peculiarities of FFP at the time in in the championship, which caused us to follow follow the rules. So there is, there is no you know, equitable solution that goes along the leagues. Two very, very different um, viewpoints on how it actually runs. Okay, great. And we'll be coming to... There is no financial justification to us thinking that the club should ever be relegated. Let's just make it very clear and simple. <laughs> right. it, It, it does not matter what happened on a financial perspective that somebody has somehow analyzed in an algorithm using AI <laughs> that is better for the club. It's not better for the club. It's not better for the community, and it's not better for QPR. So that would, that's never, ever going to be in question. Great stuff. And uh, we're just going to ask a stadium question to you, Ruben, and then Gareth will be coming to you regarding some on-pitch matters. But to you, Ruben, as there seems to be no short or medium-term prospect of a new ground, especially one funded by the local council, do the board now have any plans to significantly improve or revamp aspects of Loftus Road? The success of changes like safe standing, pitch technology, suggests that inventive ideas can yield significant improvements on the site. So I think um, we've had lots of... Um, we've explored many sites around the area. And um, I think it's very difficult to find a good site nearby here. I think we have to go quite far away, which we don't want to create a soulless bowl. I think that's what I've been, that, that's the phrase I've been told, we don't want a soulless bowl. So, um, and, and, and the idea of trying to move to Linford Christie, I think is getting very, very remote. Um, and, and as a result, I think doing something at this current site is probably the best idea for us. 
And we've been actually working with the council um, very closely, um, trying to see what other, what ways we can do, what, what ways we can try to achieve something here. And I think they've been very, very supportive um, over the last two years. And I think we, we're going to continue great discussions with them. And hopefully, when we're all ready, we can actually reveal a lot more about how we want to redevelop or, or further enhance this current site. Great stuff. Thank you, Ruben. Okay, coming to you, Gareth. Um, firstly, this is a, a question with regards to the development squad, and obviously we'll be coming back to the guys on other matters as well. But a question for you, Gareth. Do you think, this is from Matthew Druitt, do you think our development squad has good potential and we'll see a few of them feature in more first-team matches? Yeah, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, good question again. Obviously, the development squad is, uh, is one of the key areas when I came in. Uh, we spoke about uh, youth development's really important at QPR, and uh, and we've seen you know the fruits of Seni, of Ilias, of Sinclair now is coming through, and Ryan Colley obviously uh, playing a lot more games now, becoming an asset for the club. But to answer the question in short, yeah, without a doubt, there's uh, there's some real fruit in the development squad. I think that overlooked is the work that some of our coaches have done down below, you know, because Ryan Colley was here since he was nine years old, so. His under nine coach has played a part in him playing in the first team at the moment. So again, shows we're on a good path in the uh, in the academy. Um, I know Ale Alex is in the room and, and he's done a fantastic job with the youngsters uh, and we've got some great protocols in place there. The fact that we've moved to the Heston training ground now with the academy, I mean, touching distance from the first team, again, is a vision that the club had of, uh, of them being able to feel it see it, smell it, get get in there, you know, and um, I think there's one or two in the development squad that will feature this season. I think you'll see some more minutes from uh, from a couple of players. Um, we're not going to go crazy because obviously, you know, th it's a tough league, it's a championship league, but um, with everything financially which has been talked about, um, I'm very open to, uh, to giving some experience to these youngsters, blooding them at the right time, and, um, and yeah, so the answer is... Uh, you know, the, a short yes, there is definite talent in that development squad which we will be using in the first team, if not this year, in the coming years. Great stuff. And a question also to you, Gareth, yeah. from Darren Hunt. What area of first of the first team do you want to enhance and what plans are in place for this? <laughs> yeah, the, the boys are probably watching this, so if I say an area, <laughs> they're all going to start panicking that uh, they're not playing well enough. Listen, uh, we... Um, I've always said it's the right player, the right player, the right price, the right time. Um, you know, um, there's a potential. There's a potential. St still, maybe we could we could make signings in the, in in the free agent market. Um, I don't really want to say which area this is going to be in. You know, um, people have told me, um, you know, we, we don't score enough goals. We haven't got what, a great you know, double figure goal score over the years. I think it's being harsh. I think that um, we've shared the goals up top quite a bit, you know, and if they want a 20 goal season striker, then, you know, we, we, we're looking at, you know, your likes of Lyndon, of Sinclair, of, of you know, getting, getting more goals and how we produce more goals for these players. So it's a team thing. It's not really a, a, a one-off question. You know, I think we've, we've balanced the squad quite well this season. Um, you know, people will look at it and you might your own opinions of, of where we're short. But believe me, we've got a couple of multi-positional players as well who can play in these areas. Um, yeah, don't write off no one else joining us, but it's got to be a spectacular deal to, to get someone in now um, who's going to be good enough to join the squad. But um, no, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really pleased with where we are at the moment. And I think some of our best signings this year will be our performance team, our sports scientists, our medics, I think, when I came in last year, we were a little bit, a little bit all over the place with injuries, and and for one reason or another, that was maybe, you know, some signings that we'd just been unlucky, some some reoccurrences. This year, you know, touch wood, we've been we've been very lucky with the injuries. Uh, but when you say the word lucky, you've got to look into the work that they've done behind the scenes to keep them robust. You know, so only Jimmy at the moment being injured is a is a, you know it's a super availability. So I think some of the best signings have been on that side of things and uh, keeping everyone fit is going to be, uh, you know, that's going to be really important this season. Okay, as it was your first QBR fans forum as head coach, I thought I'd give you a couple of easy looseners. I didn't afford the, the same to Amit, which probably wasn't a, a very smart career move on my part, <laughs> but a follow-up <laughs> question for you, Gareth, a yep. bit more juicy. This is from Christopher Kemp. 
Gareth, if you can speak about it, which means it's going to be an interesting question, how true were the rumours of a group of players undermining you last season? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, the, uh, the same rumours that Les Ferdinand left because we fell out of our transfer signings. That, is that the same rumours that they were? Or, no, that, absolutely. No, the boys are a great bunch of boys. Uh, I think the conspiracy theories uh, are rife at this place and everyone loves a, loves a rumour. And the social media getting out now is, uh, you know, the boys have been nothing but receptive since I've come in. Absolutely receptive. If, if anyone w tried to undermine me, I, I mean, I wouldn't air it in public, but there's, there's absolutely no, no case of that at all. I, I came into a, a, a group that were quite lost, a little bit of, uh, a little bit of hurt egos and, and needed a bit of leadership, you know, and the likes of Begovic and G Cook, um, Colback coming in. I think so offering that now on the pitch, and I think you can see that. I think we can feel it all. But um, yeah, there was there's no, yeah, there, <laughs> there was no case of anyone undermining. There might have been a few comments in the dressing room when I wasn't there, but um, <laughs> there was definitely no, uh, no, no, uh, no mutiny. No, uh, and and to be fair, the the ship we run, the players we've got in now, that the the, uh, the culture that's developing at the training ground is uh, is one that I would be amazingly surprised if, if anything like that happened. They'd always come to us, they'd always try and sort it out as men and talk. Um, and that's that's what they've got at this place, you know, and, and um, I say it's a, it's a good club, really good club and really proud to be the manager. Okay, great stuff. And you, you reference player availability. Um, question with regards to that area. There's been concern among many supporters at the lack of player fitness. What's most alarming is you seem to suggest it has been planned that players would not come to full fitness until they played a number of games. Even with the intention of reducing muscle injuries, this seems a very strange plan. That we conceded late in the games against Norwich and Ipswich suggests players were struggling to maintain their performance to the final whistle. Why couldn't be players be brought up to speed during pre-season? Is this a plan Ben Williams has produced? Please give us a full explanation from David Muir. Um, I wish Ben was here right now because he, uh, he could answer this question. Well, is Ben is very ben? much <laughs> present and in the oh, building. Oh, Ben's here, yeah. Ben is here. He sneaked <laughs> in. <laughs> okay, put your hands together for Ben Williams. Oh, man, I so thought you were still upstairs, yeah. So Ben is our Director of Performance. Um, so, Ben, we can just check that you were listening at the back there with regards to that question. Uh, yeah, hi, hi everybody. Um, thanks for the specific question and having me. Um, was the end of the question give detail? Please give a full explanation, yeah. You'll be sorry. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I hope you're all I hope you're all going straight home after this because you're going to sleep well. Um, no, I guess there's there's a couple of components to this. There is um, fitness is multi-dimensional. Um, we we look at players' health, we look at their fitness and their robustness. Um, their health is are they healthy enough to absorb the load and intensity that we're giving them, like from a cellular point of view. There is the robustness. Are their muscles and tendons strong enough for us to put a lot of load through them? And then after that, you gain fitness. So um, pre-season, six weeks. Uh, an aerobic adaptation, which is getting fitter, takes about 12, 8 to 12. So if anybody um, tells you that they could have got them f to their peak fitness in six weeks, they're defying the lords of science, which I didn't invent, and I'd like to speak to that person because I'd love to know how they did it. Um, so the philosophy coming in, um, and when I was asked to join the club, um, one, of the, one of the challenges that was proposed to me was how do we avoid the injuries that we had last season? So a lot of my focus was then drawn to what was the causation of those injuries. The causation of those injuries was a rapid increase of load and inappropriate load. So either being trained too hard too soon or not being ready for the games that they were put in. And that's why you get injuries. So um, part of the question is correct that it was planned because I didn't believe under science and the group that we had, we could accelerate somebody to peak fitness in six weeks and not get injured. So we took the decision as a multidisciplinary performance group and in consultation with Gareth that we would make players robust first so they didn't get injured and we would build their fitness over the first four to six games. Um, 
a bit of background on that, August availability was 91%, which is the highest this club's ever had. So we took a decision to approach robustness and we've started to achieve that. And I think you've seen that the fitness is also coming and we're being competitive in terms of our distance and our meters run. Um, so I did decide to go down a route in consultation with the club, but it was for the reasons of science. Um, and hopefully that mostly answers your question. I'm sure later on, if you've got any more, I, I can help answer those. Um, and if anybody wants to go really, really deep, I suggest you have a couple of vodkas. Come and see me later and I'll get you ready for bed. <laughs> <laughs> can, can, can I just add something, that Paul? And that is that I think what Garrett says is, is so correct. Some of the best signings we had in this off-season were people like Ben who've come in and, and given us um, so much knowledge and, you know, um, a new process that we need to follow. And I just wonder whether it'd be useful just to give a little bit of background and context on Ben and why we feel so lucky that he's joined us, but also, you know, your previous work experience. So maybe it would be useful just to explain where you've come from, Ben, and, and so that people understand the context of, of why we're uh, adopting maybe new philosophies now. Okay, so, um, yeah, I guess my history is I, I've come from the Ineos Grenadiers cycling team, um, which some of you are already thinking, oh, well, that was probably a mistake because, you know, there's no football. Um, Ineos is quite a big organisation. Ineos own seven different sports teams across rugby, football, with OGC, Nice and louis Anne, Ineos Grenadiers, Britannia, um, the sailing team. Um, and I was head of performance for, uh, for 2.5, so I was head of performance for sailing, cycling, and last season I restructured OGC Nice. Um, with a little bit of success, they beat PSG 3-2 the other day, so I can say that. Um, I come from very much an innovation background, so I've worked in Formula One with Red Bull, um, and this is now my seventh sport, so I think over the years, over the last 20 years, I've developed an understanding of performance, not from a singular lens, but from a zoomed out, what does human performance actually mean? Are we ethically looking after athletes? Are we trying to make their careers long? Because you, you and we all love them. You know, one thing I know about athletes is we don't get to stand on top steps and we don't get to stand on podiums and we don't get to stand in front of, you know, 20,000 people with our arms in the air when we still scored a goal. And the pressures and physicality that those people go through to get to that point is something that we collectively probably can't achieve. But understanding what that individual goes through and whether they're robust or not psychologically and physically um, and understanding the sporting demand. So you have an athlete and you have a demand of a sport and somewhere between their ability and what is required on a Saturday is a gap. And true performance is understanding that gap, profiling it and creating an individual plan for every athlete so they can close it as quickly as possible. And that's my background. I come from a background of closing the performance gap. And when I heard about the role, um, you know, I played football growing up. Um, I do like to move sport and keep my mind fresh. And when I heard about the role and the vision of the board, I became more and more interested in the philosophy, where the club was going, what they were trying to achieve. And then when I had a cultural fit with Gareth, it turns out we're actually quite similar in philosophy. Um, I haven't got the same skinny jeans and long hair, but we think quite similarly. Um, and I would definitely never be the front man. You know, I think I'm more of a drummer in the background in the twilight. But um, from, a, from, a, from a vision point of view and from a philosophy point of view, there was a real cultural fit for me. And I was really happy to take the role and bring that 20 years of experience in sports performance and closing a performance gap I I into, into the hours and you know, into what we hope will be a roll down. So not just in the first team, but drive that philosophy all the way down through our academies, women's and community. S so everybody gets the same philosophy of closing a performance gap. And I'd try to, I'd like to think that we're gonna dismantle science and bring a meaningful, usable version of it to everybody. Because somewhere in the underpinning science of performance, there is a delivery strategy for all, and that's what I hope to achieve here. Well, but one, it was an interesting way to put the question, in terms of what we conceded late, and you know, therefore the players aren't fit. But 
that's sometimes your eyes are telling you something, but we, you know, I think what should be measured should be, you know, needs to be measured. And now, with most of the stadiums are, are, are having implemented um, cameras where you can actually get the data for everything that you, you can measure on a player's fitness in terms of recoveries, high speed runs, and everything. Is there anybody that you, you know, with comparisons, so we can actually do a direct comparison? This is what we did, this is what they did. Is there anybody who's outrun us? Um, it's, a, it's an interesting question. So um, we have our own GPS data. Have you ever noticed the little lumps on the back of their shirts? So that, that's GPS. That allows us to see lots and lots of metrics. And our, our job is to decipher those metrics and see what's important and what's not. Um, as well as that, around the stadiums now, and installed recently at Loftus was something called Second Spectrum, which means we can see our data plus the opposition's data, which we couldn't see before. Um, depending on the tactics of the game and who you're playing against and the tactics they employ, and also the pitch size. So at Loftus Road, generally our outputs are a little bit lower because the pitch is smaller. Um, but in general, we're not being hugely outrun by any team that we've that we've seen this season. Even some of the teams that the 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 visual potentially for the fans has been oh we've been we've been outran, but tactics play a big part in that, and we haven't necessarily in any of our data points been shown to be hugely outrun. Um, in fact, in some of them, we've got some of the fastest, most physical <coughs> players in the league. Um, so, you know we. We use our assets where we can use them based on science. And in other areas, we use our other strengths, whether that's physicality <coughs> or tactics or you know, employing the data that's in front of us to create a competitive advantage. We're not going to talk about what those are because we don't want everybody to see them. But you know, the, the short answer to your question is our job is to understand the data that underpins closing a performance gap, and we're doing that. But we're not seeing anything necessarily alarming in any of our data, and we're actually quite competitive across the park. So the so point I really wanted to get across is, uh, you know, you, sometimes you, the, a goal, a result can cloud the judgment of what you're thinking, but the reality is we have the objective data to say, no, nah, the boys are actually putting in a shift. Yeah. Great stuff. Thanks very much. And thanks very much, Ben Williams. <laughs> Ter Terry, Terry, how's that aerobic adaptability coming? Okay, and a, a follow-up question to you, Gareth, with regards to injuries from James Miller. Why is the club never giving us any details on player injuries? This is proven to be extremely detrimental because fans are left in the dark and then stay, start making up scenarios, etc. Because every other club in the world look at our press conferences and try to pick their team on, on who's fit and who's not fit. And if I start giving away secrets that somebody's not playing, they'll change their team, they'll change their tactics based on that. This is a thing now that happens in football. Every, every other club, we do it. We, we scour the internet. We scour um, everything we can to find out if a player's fit or not. So long term, as we've, we've said, you know, Jimmy Dunn was out for a long term. But when he gets close to the game of returning, I'm not going to give you the exact moment he's going to return because then that team will go, oh, Dunn's back in. Um, you know, he's had a shoulder injury. Maybe we can, we can put the ball on him and then... Everyone moans at me because Jimmy Dunn win, didn't win a header because somebody was holding his shoulder down, but the opposition knew who he was playing on. So it, this is this is uh, this is to protect the the formations, the the surprise maybe of the of the game's tactics. But long term, as we will make sure we tell you if somebody's out for a, a while, we're going to tell you, you know. Um, and and that's about where we are. I'm hoping there's not much more injury news to put out there because of what Ben's just said and the robustness of the players, you know, that are coming back. Um, and so at the moment, Jimmy's the only injury and uh, everyone else is fit for selection for tomorrow night. Great stuff, thanks. Gareth, um, a question for you, Lee. Um, why was our pitch not ready for the first game of the season against Watford? It was disappointing we couldn't have home advantage on the opening day from Simon Cunningham. Yeah, the, the, that's, that Deso pitch has a 10-year lifespan. Um, if I could squeeze 11 years out of it, I would. If I could squeeze 12 years out of it, I would. But last summer, you recall, we had a drought, which really, really, really hammered the pitch. Um, so it's not like we wake up in April and go, hey, let's restitch the Deso next month. Um, that decision gets made back in uh, well, September of last year, this, about this time, is when we were talking about it. And by November, we got to start planning and bringing equipment in. Um, now, that means you have to take into account 
the various risks. So, right, how long might we be playing? And so, uh, you, you s including like, okay, well, the playoffs are till here, so you can't do anything till after the playoffs. Well, now the fact is, you know, we did make the playoffs. I know there's some bright spark out there right now going, <laughs> playoffs. <laughs> but you know, the reality is, it's all great and well for you guys to, to, to you know, to, 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 to joke about it or whatever. But I have, to, I'm, I'm the one that's accountable for it, and I have to take that into consideration. So when we're planning this, it's like, okay, put these dates in. It has to be after this date. So we did that as soon as the uh, equipment was available, because like I said, the whole thing had to be restaged. It's not like the normal one where you just hire, you know, Mallinson's one of the pitch contractors where they come in and they, you know, take off the top layer, redress it, sand base it, bang, it's done. The whole thing had to come up, the deso completely restitched. So probably in 10 or 11 years from now, well, again, somebody will be requesting from the league, can we play our first game away, which is what I did. The league couldn't accommodate it for whatever reason, I never asked why, because it doesn't take me anywhere to get into an argument with the league about why in the hell didn't you ju ju just let us play away for the first game. Um, but we, we made arrangements with Wadford to do it. Scott Duxbury helped me out with, with, with switching the fixtures. And now, you know, looking back, we possibly maybe could have gotten away with it because of the summer we had. But at the time, couldn't take the chance. We had a prolonged drought period again. We didn't want the pitch be, be, being hammered. So, you know, as anybody who's seen the pitch now, you know, it's great. Grounds when the agronomist all said, better to play more games in January and give the pitch time to, to, to bet in than it is to, to go on there. So pitch is in really good nick. We, we got 99 problems, but if pitch ain't one, <laughs> hit me. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't get the musical reference, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, a question from a, a number of supporters. Um, Lee, what is the situation regarding the director of football role? Are we looking to bring in a director of football yourself or Amit or Ruben? <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to be the director of football, no. Yeah, so uh, I can take it. But, uh, we are and have been uh, looking for one, uh, for a senior hire, football related. Um, whatever the title is, we'll see. Um, it's a process that uh, in earnest has been led by Richard Riley, who you guys have all now met, and uh, ably, I hope, supported by the rest of the board. Uh, the answer is that we do feel that that's a skill set that we will benefit from and that we have to bring. So the process has been underway now for quite a long time. We've interviewed a, uh, a lot of interested candidates. Uh, I think that we've realized that it's a, an incredibly important appointment. And so we're trying to make sure that we do two things. Number one, that we appoint the right person. And number two, that we don't rush necessarily into making the appointment now that you know the windows close, other things. It probably affords us a little bit of, of time. So short answer, yes, we are trying to bring in somebody um, uh, senior to help uh, lead on footballing matters. Um, but uh, we're not necessarily in a rush. We'd much rather just make sure that we get the appointment correct. And so it's been a long and a robust process. Um, and as soon as there's something to announce, of course, we'll announce it. Great stuff. Thanks very much. OK, uh, there were a number of questions with regards to catering. I um, don't think we'll spend too long on that subject, bearing in mind who we have on the top uh, table. But there were significant questions in this area, so it would be remiss not to cover them. So we have invited the Managing Director of Stadium and Venues for Elior, which who are our exclusive catering contractors, along just to address some of the matters. So please welcome Craig Stewart. <laughs> okay, thanks Craig. So there were a number of questions, so I think well, I'll just pass over to you to, to address them, which obviously you're aware of those challenges. Yeah, great, thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for, for the invite this evening. Um, I believe this is my third time of uh, being along to one of these events and personally I found this very useful just for being fully transparent on where we are from a, a catering point of view. So yes, as we referred to, there was a number of questions and the most popular question of all was around pricing and the price we're charging ultimately for, for various different items out in the, the stadium concourses just now. Um, just give you a bit of background on it. When you look at the journey we've all been through in post-pandemic era and looking at what we did last year in 2022, as part of a price model, we as a club and as a catering partner decided that the cost would be minimised as part of that. And again, this year, that has been our strategy as well. When you look at our market and our sector, we as an industry, we've been absolutely hammered with inflation. 
Um, at times, it's been up at 18, 20 percent. And throughout the season, we committed to the club that, that we wouldn't rise any of our prices as we've gone through that. When we got to the summer this year, we had to make some really tough decisions on it. Um, we looked at it from a, a food and beverage point of view, and again, the, the inflation at such record levels. Looking at the small detail as well around staff, staff as well, the, the increase in staff in labour was way over 10% as an increase, which absolutely is, is the right thing to do. CO2, there's an extreme shortage of CO2 out there, so to pour that beer, there's an even you know, huger implication sitting in the background. And through working with the club and several negotiations, we decided that we would minimise the price increase as much as we could, and we both were able to share that, that inflation piece between us and then increase to 10% across the board. I appreciate that, that that sometimes can be a hit to fans, absolutely given where we are in the world right now and inflation. Everybody's managing throughout it, but what we did was look at the, the, the data, look at the facts and made sure that we, we did what we thought was fair and reasonable across the board. Looking at other questions that have been raised, um, um, some of the points are around food and offers of food. And what people probably don't appreciate in the stadium is we've got over 13 choices of hot food in the stadium. And out of that, 85% of it is, is majority is either chips or pies. And then people look at social media and see lots of different things being offered by other clubs. But the facts and the reality of that, we, we aren't set up infrastructure-wise behind the scenes to facilitate huge volume. And what we look at doing is trying to facilitate getting the service out as quick as we possibly can. We have got kiosks around the stadium where we offer different varieties of food. However, what you'll find sitting next to your traditional pie within the stadium is that, that by far will still totally outsell anything called. Now, that can be curry, it can be pizzas, it can be loaded fries, whatever it is. The, the facts and the data are that traditional pie um, at a football stadium is the top selling item. We also got some questions around uh, our people and our staff. and. I think the last time we, we discussed this as well, and I just wanted to, to re-emphasise it. Sadly, as a football club, we're open 25 days a year here. And to offer a shift to staff, we can only offer 25 days a year. And that's, that's allowing for a cup run, that's allowing for a home fixture, etc. The average shift for that work is between five and six hours. So ultimately, we're only able to offer somebody 125 hours a year. That, that, that's the facts. We, we pay living wage because it's the right thing to do and we want to make sure that we're competitive to the high street is doing that. We also, um, as, as part of an organisation, as a company, we try and offer shifts elsewhere throughout our, our business. But attracting and retaining staff is very, very difficult. Um, our, our biggest challenge uh, is, is Westfield, where people are guaranteed shifts every single Saturday and Sunday for that demographic that would come and work here. So despite our best efforts, despite... You know, the, the huge high turnover of staff, we, we do find it very, very difficult to retain staff. And of course, as part of that, we're having to continually train staff. And what may look from as a fan and, and also for myself as well, it's just a continual turn that looks as if mm -hmm. it's inexperienced staff. We absolutely recognise that we, we work continuously to try and overcome these hurdles, but it's a very, very difficult thing to do. However, what I would say, you look at Saturday's game there we just delivered, and as, as a business and, and working in conjunction with the club, that's been our busiest ever match day, albeit that was led by a, a huge away support who, you know, record beer sales as well for, for that part of the ground. Um, but looking at what we're doing, you know, we are, we are investing. We invested, a lot of you won't have seen it, but, you know, a huge EPOS system sitting back of house for everybody to, to get served quicker ultimately. And apart from the, the blue and white bar, we're now a cashless venue as well. So again, that two or three seconds uh, sort of gain in, in service times across the stadium is improving the, the overall queue times. Um, so yeah, listen, we, we appreciate we're on a journey here. We appreciate back of house, the facilities, etc. People want to see different options, but data tells us, you know, you know serve good beer, serve quick beer, um, and, and do it within the half-time restraints, then nine out of 10 fans will go home happy. And that will always be my objective, working in conjunction with the club. Excellent. Thank you very much, and thanks for joining us, Craig. Greatly appreciated. Thank you. Okay, we've just got a few more questions, then we'll open for questions from the, from the floor. Um, and firstly, coming to you, Lee, with regards to the tannoy, a number of comments regarding this, this particular one from Greg Slovic. The tannoy is totally inaudible. I can't hear anything. The recent on-pitch interview with Jerry Francis remains a complete mystery. Why is the speaker, which is 30 feet above my head, directed out onto the pitch and not back into the South Africa road stand? 
Yeah, this has been an ongoing issue for several years. I think we've, we've explained before in terms of it's not actually the speakers, it's the wiring within the speakers, and to wire, rewire the, the, everything um, is six digits. We're talking hundreds of thousands of pounds, which we just don't have to do. And I did have an idea in the closed season, which is, okay, other artists put up and, and take down. Maybe there's a blue, you know, something in terms of technology that if we set up an alternative speaker system, because again, the money's not in the speakers, it's in the wiring, and we use Bluetooth, could we do something just for interviews that, that would do it? Um, I thought it would be easier than it is, but apparently I've, I've checked with, with quite a few people. I, I haven't had any positive responses on it. So again, listen, I, you know, the latest one was um, one of our, our, our players' father actually does this, and I've said, you know, just had a chat with him over the weekend when I found out about it, and said, Get your dad to get in contact with me because I want to talk to him about it because you know I really really want to see what I can do to resolve this. So, but again, we, we you know we got a big fan base out there. If anybody can think of an, a, a you know a system that I can set up alongside the one that we have have right now that doesn't require you know a ma massive amount of, of, of infrastructure revamp, then let's do it. Because I, I, I just I just can't believe the technology that's out there. We can't find something that's not wireless that we can just put it into the stadium. Um, so I'm still on the lookout, but that's, that's, um, that's where we're at with that right now. And um, I am always open to suggestions in terms of alternative solutions. Okay, and just a couple more for you, Lee. Uh, can I ask? I thought with everybody up here, this would be the one I cruised. Well, no. I, yeah. <laughs> Could I ask what the club is doing in terms of utilizing the new Heston training ground in terms of seeking revenue? Are the club considering potential naming rights to a sponsor in order to generate extra income, and or could it be through hiring out the facility to clubs, as indicated a few months ago? The answer is yes to all the above. Um, you know, we've got a few deals in the pipeline now. Australian national team is going to be doing there. We've got a big um, rental coming up with Paddy Power coming up this Friday. So yeah, that has already started to show great, great promise in terms of um, of uh, you know generating revenue. So quite pleased with. It. So in addition to the to the facility being fantastic for the players. Um, and there was, you know, people like when, when Steve Cook came in and said this facility is top notch. You know, it's 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 one. Of the, it's probably the best I've ever been to. That means a lot. And it helps us sway those players. You know, and I think again, you know, you know, it's it's no good. We got somebody like Ben coming in. That's that's that's, that's the director of performance. It's giving him the tools he needs up there too, which is, is allowed us to, to, to allow that to happen with with a new training ground. But then on top of that, additional revenue opportunities as well, as well as well as sponsorship opportunities, because everybody who goes there says, "Wow, this is fantastic." It all is, is, is come together very nicely. Okay, and one more question from me. If you do have a question, if you just want to raise your hand, and we've got a couple of roaming mics, and they can make the microphone down to you just while I'm asking and hearing the answer to this question. It's um, to you, Lee, from Neil McLean. I've shared this on QPR Pride of London and QPR Independent Facebook fan pages and on the QPR Facebook page. Would you consider moving home games to a 7.15 kickoff and maybe campaign to other clubs? Uh, for example, I may have gone to Leeds and Birmingham games away coming up if this were the case, um, although I recognise Sky called the tune with the Birmingham game, but I do think more of the fan base would choose 7.15 if you put it to the vote. Look, look, it's an interesting proposition, and I'm all, all in favor of saying, let's think outside the box, and this thing, you know, it's, it's something that we can't unilaterally do, but it's something I, have, I could discuss with the league. So, you know, we have, there is a league meeting coming up. Um, in fact, chief executive of the league is here tomorrow night, so I'll actually run it by him tomorrow night and say, what do you think? Can we put this on the agenda? My, my gut feeling is, though, we really struggle to get people in by 7.45. Um, you know, that is our latest walk-up in terms of tr people trying to get to the game just because it's difficult with, with getting for work. And I suspect if we, if we you know, the least you know, we can do is, is, is ask the question, though. But let's see. But it wouldn't surprise me if people came back and said, no, it's, in fact, move it back to 8 o'clock because that makes it easier for me to get there. So, so y the, the problem is different circumstances for different people. You, you, you'll never please everybody, you, you know, but you just try to find the, the best common denominator that you possibly can. Okay, great stuff. Thanks very much. Okay, we'll take our first question from the floor, and the hands are, are now raising. We're <laughs> We've covered a, a few matters so far, but like I say, I want to give you the opportunity um, to ask questions direct from the floor. So first question over to you, sir. Evening, everyone. Uh, I wanted to ask something that Les complained about in a few interviews was about the EPP rules and us losing, I think he said, eight players before they were 16 to Category 1 academies, and we're essentially powerless to stop that. So I was wondering, with now the new training ground, whether the board had any plans to upgrade us to a Category 1 academy, and if not, uh, how come? Well, 
I don't think it makes a massive difference right now for us to jump to that level. And there's actually a lot of cost involved to go to a Cat 1. Because we get we have the same games program anyway, so it's not as though we... We haven't really lost um, players to Cat 1 academies. I don't think that's the, the first thing. We've lost players to bigger badges, right? So players who want to then go play for you know um, Spurs or some other club. I think that's why we've lost the players, not so much because they're Cat 1. So I think if we move to Cat 1, you know, we might get slightly bigger compensation for them uh, if they did move to another Cat 1 Academy. But I, I don't think, um, I think the additional income we have to, I mean, the additional cost we have to spend on being a Cat 1, I think might be also prohibitive. And I think that's where we have to be very careful about what we want to start spending on. Because the amount you spend on this as well, it also counts towards PNS. So it's not as though it can be, you know, um, not counted to that. So. So, so I think we have to be careful about where we want to be. And I think we, with the games program that we get being in London, uh, we don't necessarily have to get to Cat 1 right now. Um, and I think, but I think in the future, especially once we can move the dome across from across the road back to where we are, and I th because I think the dome still has value from where it is, so there's no need, need to rush that. And I think the, the kids are getting uh, you know, as much, uh, they, they have the, uh, enough facilities for, to do exactly what we need to do. So I don't think we need to actually move that right now. But when we do, I think then it would be much easier to move to Cat 1 and, and make the other investments uh, necessary for that. So I, so I think even if we move now, I don't think it's, it's about that, because I think the bigger badges is what attracts some of these kids to move to those other clubs. OK, thanks. Ruben, and next question just down here on the left. Hi, guys. Um, yeah, this is just a bit of a question on um, sort of signings and who we've brought in. Um, just had a question. Obviously, with the FFP, um, Kieran Richards, who we signed from... Um, Brighton, I think it was that when he signed on loan, we had an agreement with Brighton that we was going to sign him for three years. I just Taylor, Taylor, Richards. Taylor Richards, yeah. Taylor Richards, sorry, yeah, uh, for three years. And um, he obviously didn't play for us last season. Obviously, Gareth would know why he's not playing now. But I just seem that's a bit strange if we're in the FFP... Um, we're in, we're in the FFP to obviously make a decision um, like that and um, also wanted to ask on the money we the money we received for Senny Diang that was obviously um, disclosed and obviously the money we we've saved from Leslie's wa Leslie's wages <laughs> and the money we got from Sky last year Obviously, that's money that possibly could have come in into the club for the budget. So I just wanted to know what what um, the reasoning was on on that, really. Okay, so two questions there. Firstly, the Taylor Richards question. So, uh, Lee, if I come to you regarding well, that, just I'll, the actual. I'll transfer. address it from 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 a structural standpoint. You can address it in terms of the playing standpoint. In, in terms of uh, it was it was structured that way because the manager at the time actually wanted to bring him in on a permanent move. I didn't want to do it on a permanant move at that time because if we'd have done that, we'd have had, it'd have gone towards the PNS calculations straight away. So by pushing it back a year um, it, it, um, and saying no, it's, it's instead of a, a four-year deal, it's a loan with an obligation to buy, and the PNS actually doesn't come in until this year, so it saves it from from being uh, showing up on the books for last year. In the old days, it was great; you just did a deal and. and, and um, and, and that was it. But now you have to be kind of creative and figure out how does this really work into the PNS and moving numbers around all the time. So that was it. But at the time that you know, again, different managers see things different ways. Um, you know, from a, a recruitment standpoint, you know, we all know that Taylor has a, a lot of a lot of um, potential. Uh, he's got the talent. You know, the, you know, people like Ben, people like Gareth. You know, we want to try to get the, 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 the what we can out of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But but. Yeah, the structure the structure of the deal was the structure of the deal was done to aid us in PNS, yeah. so, which, which it did. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, and then Gareth just turning to you with regards to how Taylor's getting on. Yeah, Taylor's getting on uh, fine. He had a really tough uh, year last year. Yeah, he's actually not played a great deal at, at this level. You know, he played a lot of Doncaster in League One. Uh, he's been chucked from club to club, which is really. Uh, sort of tough on a player, you know, and when he comes back, he, he, uh, he gets an injury at the start of last season, 
there's four different managers come in. Um, we're in a real battle, and he's not that kind of battling player um, that you needed. I think he was signed more for the, uh, you know, the, the silky seals going forward. I've seen that in him. Um, we've also had one or two little issues pre-season, but nothing major. And Taylor, he's getting up to full fitness. Uh, I, I need him to be fitter, uh, and he knows this, to, to play the way I want to play uh, the, the, the positions that we play. So Taylor's getting up to fitness. We're working hard on him. Um, but obviously, you know, you, you, if you trust me on that one, it's, uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a good kid. Um, just been through a lot in, uh, in such a young life. We still remember he's only 22 years old. And, you know, if you all remember back to 22, was, we, all, uh, we all weren't the finished article, were we? So, yeah, we're just working hard on Taylor. And in terms of the follow-up with regards to the player sales, such as Seni Dieng, Contributes yeah, to the city gang. Do. Actually, well, I mean, I mean, it's not disclosed. Someone may have printed it, but um, yeah, no, I think he, he said un I think he meant undisclosed. Yeah, undisclosed. Sorry. Yeah. So, and that obviously those sales just contributed towards what we were able to yeah, do. Hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question. Okay, we've got a question here, and we've got someone at the back with their hand up. Head for next on the left. Okay, you. Hi there. Um, I've got two questions. I'll make them really quick. Uh, one for you, Ruben. Um, you said at the top of the meeting that you had unfinished business at QPR. Can you give us a few examples of like what you meant by that? Because I was really fascinated by that. Hmm. And one for you, Amit. Um, at the end of last season, uh, you—I don't know if it was an interview or something you wrote—but it was on the QPR website that that the club would have a period of reflection. On what? Because obviously, you know, last season wasn't it was quite tough. Um, what happened? What took place in that period of reflection? And, and you know, can you tell us a bit more about what the outcome of that was? So, what I meant just now was, um, as I've mentioned many, many times before, um, and I think some people don't like this word. I like I like the word called sustainable, and I want to make the club sustainable. And I think that's my unfinished business. The club needs to sell players every single year in order to just break even. There's this, there's, there's, you know, uh, of course now with FFP, you don't actually have to break even, you can lose 30 million pounds, but I don't think we want to leave the club in a place where it, it, every season you need to pump in at least 13 million pounds just to, you know, pay the bills. So it, for me, th that's where I want to bring the club towards, something which is sustainable, which actually can fund itself, right? So, you know, something like the training ground really helps because we don't have to pay somebody else rent for the training ground anymore. And, and what people don't realize is that when you spend 25 million to build that, it's not so much about how much you spend there. That 25 million doesn't count to FFP, but the fact that you don't pay rent anymore, that helps FFP. So if we can actually make better facilities here, um, better facilities, well, which gets us more sponsorship or allows us to commercialize things even better, then that investment also helps make the club a lot more sustainable. And, and of course, the idea is also to make the academy very, um, uh, fruitful and developing players and therefore we can actually start selling players on a continuous basis which again will help make the club more sustainable so for me um, my, my long-term goal um, and, and, and my unfinished business is actually to make the club a lot more sustainable going forward yeah um, and then you're absolutely right uh, uh, I think Ruben and I did an interview together in which I said that we would have a period of reflection and the answer is that we uh, is that we abs absolutely did have a very, very strong and prolonged period of reflection. I mean, I hope one day when we're all much older, we'll sit back and think about last season and we'll actually be able to have a bit of a chuckle about how crazy it was. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is when we were living through it, I mean, it was as treacherous a season as you can imagine, <laughs> you know, from where we started and the way we ended and to go and get points away at Burnley, it's crazy. And one day we laugh about it, maybe over a beer, but at that point in time, for me, it, that was the hardest season that I think I'd, I'd been involved with the club with. And it definitely required, and requires even now, in my opinion, for everybody to look introspectively and understand why it happened, wh what caused it, how can we try to make sure that we are better as a result of it, learn from those mistakes. And that really requires us to be very reflective about what happened. So what did we do? is your question. The answer is that, and I think it's the first time that I can remember us doing this at QPR, and I think everybody at, uh, here would attest to it, is that we have gone back and we looked at every function that this club performs. And that is the job that the board does, that is the job that the executives do, the performance people do, the medics do. There is not a vertical currently at this football club that is not under review and that we're not going back 
reflecting over and understanding how you can make it better. To Ruben's point as an example, let's just remind ourselves that PNS is the difference between your revenue and your cost. There are four revenue streams in any football club. Number one is the money that you get from television. Everybody gets the same in the league. Number two is your sponsorships. Um, I think that you know, a lot of credit must go to people like Ewan in the back, who's leading commercial. I think going into this season, because of his efforts, and I think, again, it's the first time it's happened since I've been involved in the club, I think every bit of sponsorship that can possibly be sold, every bit of commercial that can be realized, while it hasn't happened now, during the course of the season, that will happen. And that's the first time it's happened. It's because we've gone back, really, truly reflected, and say, what do we need to do better in order to get that revenue stream going to? Third is around uh, your stadium capacity or match day, how much revenue does the club make on a match day. And as we all know, we're to some degree limited by the size of our football stadium. And as Ruben addressed, we're fortunate that we think over the last couple of years we've made some pro positive progress with the council. And again, that's required so to go back, understand, rethink. And then the last one, of course, which is the most important way that a club makes revenue is around player trading. And again, as Ruben tested to, we've gone back, we've re-looked at the strategy, we've re-understood, and we've reminded ourselves that as a football club, we have to generate talent and we have to be able to sell that talent because that's how we will make this club sustainable. But all of that, and then you look at the costs, and whether we talk about catering, whether we talk about player salaries, whether we talk about maintenance, whether we talk about security, all of that work, Lee and his team have gone, uh, and Ruben in the back, and we've reanalyzed the whole thing. So we took a period of time, really honestly, as custodians of this football club to understand that our job, frankly, is you have to take that moment where it felt like a real kick in the, in the stomach towards the end of last season and say, it's happened, but why has it happened? And how can we go about trying to make it better? Because otherwise there's really no point in this whole process. And you, sh you should be aware, because I gotta tell you, as chairman of this football club, I'm proud of the work we did over the last few months to truly reflect to understand where those problems are. I'm not saying we've solved every one of them, but there is a huge determination to try to make those things better. At least what's in our hands, we have to get better at doing. I relate it back to running a business because that's what, I'm, you know, I've, what I've done in my life. And in a business, if things don't go well, you don't just accept it. You go and say, what's going wrong? I've got to fix it. That reflies, requires humility of knowing that we can make mistakes. And it also requires a period of reflection to say, how do I go back and fix that? So thank you for asking the question because I'm really proud really to give you the answer that everybody involved in this club, I think took it personally, took responsibility. It was not just the players. It was not just the management. It was every single person involved in the club really took responsibility for what happened last season. And I think is determined to not let that happen again or at least make sure that the mistakes that can be corrected will be corrected. And that's what we did over that period of reflection. And I hope we'll come out of it stronger than we went into it. Brilliant, thanks very much. Amit, next question. Just, Joe, before you answer, just to, to top up on, on what you said. Sometimes there's um, perceptions out there about you know, where we stand on payroll-wise, revenue-wise, everything else. The league actually do give us a benchmark every year about, you know, they sign you an anonymous number, they're saying this is where you are relative to player payroll to everybody else. This is where you are relative to, um, to revenue generation compared to everybody else. So two seasons ago, we were um, the ninth highest payers in, for, for player payroll. Because um, I think there was this, m this, this perception out there that we were in like, you know, the 20th or something like that. So no, we were a top 10 payer. But we were also ninth in revenue generation, which is when he says proud of Ruben, uh, Ewan, then, you know, that's, that's what we mean. And we actually slipped a little bit last year. We were down to, um, again, the same numbers. We tripped to 11th as, as, as highest paid um, payroll, but 11th in revenue generation. <laughs> now, for me, I always like to see us, you know, um, generating more revenue. Um, than we are in terms of, of, of um, our position, league position relative to, to player payroll. Now, Gareth now has the opportunity to really do that because our payroll has dropped quite significantly compared to the last two years. So that's that's what we're dealing with right now. But it's it's a necessity because we have to deal with the PNS implications of not having sold any players the previous two years. So so you know that's that's factual. I like to share little facts like that with you all because you know there's 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 state secrets in that. But so at least everybody knows exactly where we've been for the last two seasons and where we're heading into for this season. Sorry Joe. 
Yeah, good evening, everyone. Is that a bit too loud? Yeah. Bleeding now. <laughs> I've got a part-time job on the Thames as a foghorn. Um, Lee, I'd like to thank you for addressing the steward situation. Uh, by the way, my name's Joe Hilton. I sit at the back of the upper loft. I'd like to thank you for addressing the steward situation at the end of three o'clock kickoffs on a Saturday when we're getting kicked out of the ground after about seven minutes. We now got about 20 minutes grace at the end of the game, so it's, it's absolutely brilliant. It doesn't really affect night games because everyone wants to do the off and get home. So th that's um, a feather in your cap, mate. I'll pass that along to Josh because he's been very active. And I'm, to be honest, I was observing the stewards um, this past game. They were really proactive in terms of bag searches, going out there, tagging bags, increasing the flow rate. We had an issue from Ticketmaster with the away fans, so they had to deploy um, handheld scanners. Really, really proactive. I, f I think they've done, they, you know, they're really stepping up. And just so you know, one of the things we're trying to do is recruit more of our own stewards. That's one of, one of Josh's KPIs, because I think if we can get that continuity in there, and, and we, you, know, you start seeing the same, same faces, it'll be better. It's easier, st easier to steward. You guys know, get to know each other, which I think is... Uh, having a post-match chat, the police are standing there. They've got a hard job to do. I'm not having a go at them, but like, they stand around like mannequins. They don't do anything, and there's a lot of intimidation going on down there. So the point that I'm trying to make is up until about 10, 12 years ago, the away fans, didn't matter how many came, the coaches were at the end of South Africa Road up by the Blomfontein. And they would come out of the school end, be it lower tier, upper tier, and get on their coaches there. Now the coaches for about the past 12 years are up the other end of South Africa Road. And there's an awful lot of problems out here. The police don't know what to do. And it's going to kick off. It really will kick off out here. No one wants to see that happen, especially in this day and age. Those days are behind us. So I just wondered if there's something that can be done, especially when there's a larger wave following, instead of letting them walk up towards the White City, just have, them have their coaches down here. If you can talk to the council, I don't know if they, if they were the ones that did it in the first place. <laughs> The police, are, the police are not doing anything. And especially now, since we, John Gerrard, bless him, who's not very well, he knows a lot of us, John, uh, uh, QPR community, Hopper. And John's not here anymore. There's no one really to talk to anymore. So I just wanted to raise it with you. It's not, um, I'm not having a pop at you or the club, but if there's something can be done about, especially a larger way following, I mean, we see what happens with Millwall. They're, they're marked straight down the Uxbridge Road. That, 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 that's a one-off. You get the same problems with Birmingham, but Saturday, Saturday was horrible out there. That's it. Wild thing, I think I love you. <laughs> that's a drop the mic in it. That kind of makes my 99 <laughs> problems. <laughs> uh, so just in terms of answering the, the question there from Joe, is there... Oh, sorry, <laughs> that was a question. <laughs> <laughs> It was a question. I thought it was a statement. Um, it, it, but in terms of one, that wouldn't be a council decision. That will absolutely be the, the police. I mean, I'll, I'll have a word with them, but I suspect that they're going to say is there's, there's a traffic issue with down there. But, you, you know, all I can do is done. But at the end of the day, when the police say this is the way we want it done, you know, we can argue all we want, but um, it's going to be the way they, they, they want it done is how it gets done. Okay. Thank you, Lee. And next question. Thanks, Ed. And we've got, Ed, we've got a couple up here as well when you have a moment. OK, over to you, sir. Hi, this is for Gareth. Um, on Saturday, you mentioned about uh, Sinclair Armstrong and the fouls that were being given against him. I remember when Peter Crouch started with us and because of his height, he was having a lot of fouls given against him as well because of how it's perceived he was like fouling players. Um, is there anything other than, like, obviously speaking in media, that you can do in terms of making referees aware of that sort of incidences so that it stops? So can you talk to a referee association and just make it known that, you know, that he is just a strong lad and, and he just is too good for some players? Yeah, 
Uh, good question, and uh, I was disappointed in the in the you know the the referee inconsistency on Saturday because he seemed to he seemed to get one that he that went for him, and then all the rest. I think the Sunderland players started rolling around and thinking, you know, they'd win it by Mike Tyson, you know, which it, it just, it, I just feel for Sinclair because it's gonna, it's gonna stunt his his career definitely. Um, I've got a couple of things on this. We we meet the referees before the game, but the opposition manager meets him at the same time. So if I start going on about him, you know, letting giving leniency to Sinclair, then they're gonna go on about being fair and, and giving fouls on the centre halves. But the other the other issue for me is that the, the referees now I believe watch the previous three games for research, which I'm totally against. I think that that is inviting prejudice on, on any any decision they'll make. I, I I'm saying they're good enough to, to ref it on the day. So I'm gonna be a big advocate of the referees coming in being good enough to do it on the day and not have any preconceived ideas about how big and strong Sinclair is and and as I said Saturday, you know, it's, it's something we're going to have to deal with at the moment, but we are actually working with Sinclair as well in training. You know, I, I got two fantastic strikers in Sinclair and Lyndon, and both of them, you know, uh, they get victimised a lot by uh, giving fouls, but we're working hard on them in training. It's, it's a great question, but unfortunately, you know, it's not one I can just pull a referee to the side and start saying, look, can you let things go? Because <laughs> it's, uh, it, I, I wish I could. I'm just hoping... I'm, I'm really hoping that we get the rub of the green and we get the decisions back because there was one at Southampton. I don't know if people were there, but it, I mean, he was clean through and the guys just dived on the touchline and, and the referee's blown up. There's, they, these are game-changing moments and uh, yeah, I, I, I totally feel your pain, but um, yeah, Bob, I will, uh, I will let Sinclair know that he's, uh, he's got a lot of fans out there that are fighting for him. Yeah. Cheers. Okay, thanks. Gareth? And next question. Uh, my name is Jerry Edwards. I'm a long-term physical holder. I remember when Gareth made his debut, and I think many of us did, and we were so lucky to have him play for us. But I'm going to say two Thank positive... You. Applause for Gareth. Um, just um, two things I want to say, very positive statements. Um, I wasn't able to be at the first two games of the season because I was on holiday, but Saturday was my first game. The first one, you didn't need to be out, OK? Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> take the point. But Saturday, apart from being really hot... Wasn't it a fantastic game? Our team put everything into that game. I was blown over by the, uh, what happened on the pitch. We lost, but it was a really good game. So, you know, the, the atmosphere's changed, wasn't it? It really was a fantastic atmosphere on Saturday. So that's, I, I want to relay that from I me. I totally agree, you know, and I, and I, and I, can't, um, I can't thank people enough, uh, the, the guys next to me, you know, and I know people will say you're going to thank those people they are in charge of you, but honestly, the support I've had to make the changes when... Uh, when Amit talks about period of reflection, um, um, he, he spoke to me about what, what I could do um, and I talked to him about the culture of the place. And I feel that the culture of the place is now feeding down into the terraces. Um, people are aware of where we are as a football club and what the expectation is. And believe me, I want to be in the Premier League one day without a shadow of a doubt. But next time we do it, there'll be some sustainability about it and there'll be... There'll be, a, there'll be a base where we're not just falling through something again when we come down. It will be, it will be a sustainable, <coughs> successful story, this. It will take a little bit of time, but the building blocks and the signs are there already with the atmosphere on Saturday. The, the fans are fantastic. The players are emptying the tank for you. And that's something that I didn't see when I first came in. Um, no disrespect to anyone. Everyone has different ways of playing. My players will empty the tank, and I think that is the majority of the comment I've heard from QPR fans. As long as they give everything, you know, as long as the boys give everything, that's all we want. Listen, they will give everything, but now it's about turning these sl small margins into wins, and uh, we will do that. Believe me, just have a little bit of patience because I think there's a great feeling amongst the, the supporters and the ones who've travelled up and down the country have seen the last four games <coughs> know exactly what I'm talking about. So... Uh, I appreciate your comments. I, I, I thought, think you might have had something more to say as well. I so, have. Yeah. I, I, that's yep. one positive thing I want to say. I'm thank you. Thank you, Gareth. I mean, yes, it was really good. I want to thank one other person who says, now, that's our club ambassador who's standing behind me. Andy is a fantastic man. He comes to all of our games. <laughs> Like some of you here, I remember his debut as well. He was a terrific player for us, and the fact he doesn't live locally to us, he comes backwards and forwards to all of our games. 
evening or weekend games. What a commitment he's shown to the club. What a man to have as our club ambassador. And thank you, Andy, for everything you do for us. Here, here. So, sorry, it's just you mentioned about the atmosphere. Um, one thing I do have to say is um, the, the rail seating section that, that um, James and, and, and Terry put together and the way they've done things, the way they put the banners out and the way you guys really get things going has been absolutely top notch. So, so, so take a bow, son. <laughs> Okay, thanks very much. And just on to the next question. Thank you. Oh, hi. Yeah, I'd just like to ask a question about recruitment because FFP, notwithstanding, over the years, obviously, we've recruited players. And I kind of had the impression that while clubs like Brentford and Brighton, you know, erstwhile competitors of ours, had actually been very much using a sort of data-driven data approach, Maybe we were a bit slow on that front. And I'd like to ask all of you, really, how you reflect on how we have recruited over recent years and how that's going to change, bearing in mind what you said about the new appointment of a DIF. I think the huge difference between us and the two clubs you mentioned um, is one, like every other club in the league, apart from those two, we do use analytics and we do use data, but it's the commercially available data. They, those two have owners who actually have deeper data than any other club in the country can actually access because of the, of the owner's businesses, which is, has to do with gambling and beating the bookies. So they've got stats that we could never even dream of, and they've uh, spent tens of millions of pounds building up the, 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 those databases. So they actually have a, a business that they run that not only you know they can use the money from it, they can use all the information from it as well. So they have a massive jump on everybody, and I do mean everybody. Even Man City doesn't have what they have. So I think they've been extremely clever and extremely good at, at what they've done. And it was a, it was a damn good idea. Um, you know, for, for us, we're, we're not gonna catch up. All we can do is, is try to utilize the commercial data that's, that's the spread that we can do. And, um, and Ben has also come up with some, some other ideas that he thinks we can get some, some additional data, um, which I'm not gonna go into, um, because, uh, you, you know, I, I, again, Everybody's looking for that little proprietary, you know, niche that they can, they can get that one step ahead, that extra one percent on the rest of our competitors. So, you know, by, by working with what we think um, might be a different way with data, we're hoping we can we can do that. But one thing we won't be able to do is develop the the, the huge databases they have and the you know the the bank of PhDs they have crunching data every single day for their for their gambling businesses on on how to beat the bookies. It's always been so it's just a follow-up question just for those on, on the stream just a follow-up question with regards to the recruitment and whether it will be the director of football incoming director of football as and when that happens they'll be involved in that or it'll be a collective approach I think data will always be a part of the decision-making process it has been for a while and we will use as much data as we get uh, the recruitment process is also very much a collective process where you know candidates are brought up by the recruitment team, and then you know, verified by the manager, verified by the DOF, and then um, and then we all make the decision together in terms of whether this person should be there, or should be should not be there. I think beyond the data, beyond, beyond just the rough data, I think what's also very crucial going forward, and I think this is where we're going to spend a lot more time focusing on, is the characters we bring in. I think you know Gareth's made a lot of uh, improvement from a character perspective, and I think that's actually something which you don't really have data to, to show you, you know, uh, what kind of character people have. I think that's where we're trying to focus a lot more uh, in terms of what we do there. And I think, you know, from that side, uh, data be, whilst data is good, I think you also need to have that side of things which will also help you with regards to how you recruit going forward. Thanks, Ruben. Okay, on to the next question. Is it me? <laughs> right. Sorry, this is probably to Gareth. Um, uh, harking back to the referees, the additional minutes, yeah. I don't know if you saw Paul Heckingbottom's comments on Saturday after the extra 12 minutes at Tottenham, he wasn't happy. We had to survive 10 minutes at Cardiff when we were under the cosh, 
and then on Saturday, eight minutes in each half. Do you get an explanation, and then do you think this is going to continue? Um, good question. It's a, a real hot topic at the moment. You know, uh, they were the referees were were um, after the first weekend. There was some suggestion that they got it a little bit wrong, and they were gonna they were gonna curb it a bit. And then the next weekend, it seemed to curb a little bit. But being totally honest, uh, they tot up everything out of play now. The fourth officials, you know, they they're totting everything up, and um, I think it's the consistency again that we're gonna talk about here that they don't do it at different games at every game. Um, so I did see Heckingbottom's comments. I felt for him, you know. Obviously, that was a that was a cruel blow. Um, they were they were winding the clock down, but I don't think it was 12 minutes. You know, like you say, and our, our game, the the eight minutes for me, it's the biggest thing for me is on the performance now. And and you know, I've got 10 men on the pitch with an extra 16 minutes in their legs. People, are, you know, it was it was a, a crazy amount of time that was added on, but. They are justifying it by showing me the card and showing every every little moment that's happened and every little totting up they do. Again, it's it's there's not really an answer to this. Uh, I'm frustrated with it. Uh, I think over the season it will they will curb it, and I, and and that that will be even more frustrating because in the second half of the season if they start but going back to their twos, threes, and fives is the maximum that will kill me because I'm saying why haven't you carried on with what you started, but. Um, yeah, there's no real answer to this. The uh, the consistency is just what I want to see from referees, and I think that's every manager's uh, you know utopia. But we'll see what happens. Okay, thanks very much, and we'll just go over to one in the corner. Cheers, hi guys. Uh, it's a message for the gaffer. I think you kind of alluded on it already, but you keep going on about a culture change within the club. Yeah. What exactly was it that needed to change? Was it personnel? Obviously, there's been a number of personnel changes over the summer. Some are on the board, some players, staff members. What exactly was it and what is so different around the place now? So, uh, to start with, there was, a, there was a, a real lack of leaders and characters in the building. So, when everything's going good... Uh, you'll, you'll all know this, a lot of business people know good. You don't really see the test of your people, you know, when things are going well. They're all doing well. There are some are just joining the wave and driving on the crest of the wave. You don't know who's, who's got the wave going. But when things go bad, you can really see your characters and you can really see where your, your you know, I, I want to use some terms that, uh, that you know, I want to point the fingers at any, anyone last year. This isn't about anyone, but, the, the, you know, there's a... There's a, an insular playing for yourself. People go in their shell. People become selfish, but unintentionally selfish sometimes because there's a, you know, there's a protection mechanism that, that that comes into people, and they're just they're thinking it's not me. And if I if I get if I look after myself, this is what was that was, was a little bit of that last year. Um, so when I came it was the in same group of players that took us to top of the league, uh, and in fact. The last time because we had the fans forum, we were sitting top yeah, of the league. Things were going a certain down. manager was there who ended up leaving. The less said, the better, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but then the same group of players then ended up struggling for the remainder so, of the season. So, so you, why was that? Yeah, you've answered it a little bit yourself there. So things are going well. Everyone's great. Young players come in. Long players, great manager. A little bit of indecision with the manager. Uh, uh, chaos. The club went into a little bit of chaos. And we've got to say it did, you know, with, uh, with what happened with with Mick, and that's when your characters could have steadied the ship. And I'm saying this is a maybe thing, but this is how I see it. And that's where it went into a little bit of, um, am I going with him? Uh, will he come back from me? Am I still here? What's going to happen now with this club? Where are we? Who's the manager? What are we doing? And without your leaders, without your captains and your generals, which you know I've signed with the aforementions, Begovic, Cook, Kovac, you know, I think that they settled down the players. So... For instance, after Saturday's game, I came in the dressing room at the end of the game. I make sure every player's in there and I make sure I go and clap all of you guys because, you know, it's really important. So I'm usually last in the dressing room. I'm coming in the dressing room. Steve Cook's holding the team talk. Steve Cook's in there saying, guys, we can win on Tuesday. Forget this. this, this. They were so lucky today. Ten men, 11 men, we win that game. They had a lucky first goal. To, and I'm... I'm, I'm thinking, right, what the hell can I say now? Because <laughs> he's picked these boys up, you know. And that's, that, when it comes from your peers, it's so powerful. So as the manager, I've done my job because I've, I've brought these people in. And this is what was missing for me last year. So I know everyone talks about being top of the league on the crest of a wave and that. And, and 
I, I believe in art. I've watched some of these games that they're playing. I actually think that performed well, got away with a couple as well, some absolute yeah. worldy goals like in the last minute and things where teams were on top. And that's great. That happens sometimes. And when it's all going great, it's buzzing and everything, it's when the winter months kicked in. The, all these sort of things in football, you know, we have a great country where we have four seasons. That, so all these, for me as a manager over 10 years, I've noticed these things make a difference. And that's, that's my honest opinion on the, 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 the playing side and, and the staff side and what we've got together now. Honestly, I, I can feel it in the stadiums now, which is brilliant for me because it's, it's, it's going everywhere. And, I mean, and that's, yeah. Personally, I, I mean, I can see the culture change as well. Thank I can you. feel it around the place. And I go to watch the B team quite often down at Hamwell Town and I also communicate with the B team and I can see that that culture is also filtered down Tripping to the down, yeah. development squad. I mean, you've probably seen and heard me there, to be honest as well. I'm always <laughs> making a lot of noise. Um, but you c I can see that the youngsters now talk of a pathway and then they can see yeah. a route into the first team, which I think is only going to help build the club as well. And so hats off. And when I came in, um, uh, especially I mean, I was here when I was here 20 years ago, we, we talked about the pathway for these youngsters and how this is going to be important, you know, for the future, obviously, forward planning that, yeah, the days of, of just fantastic players, massive wages, Premier League days, they, they, you know, that sustains you for so long. But now it's about the youth now. It's about these next players coming through. We've already had it with Eze, you know, to, uh, when he came on loan to, to Wickham was fantastic to play a part in his story. But when I came in, that was one of the remits for me. So I've made sure I've been at 90% of the development games so the boys can see me there. We get invited into the dressing room at half time, which apparently hasn't happened for a long time when the manager's in there and the boys are thinking, oh my God, the manager's here. So no matter how it is, you know, on a, on a uh, you know. It's, uh, I don't want to name names, but I, I will be there and that's what's important. And that's, the, you know, that's, that's, my, uh, that's my thing. And if I'm not there, Double will be there as well. So there's always a representative there. And as I say, I can't thank um, Chris Ramsey, Paul Furlong enough because they're now replicating what I'm doing at first team level. So when these boys do step up, Stevie Baller, for instance, has been training with us. You know, we've got some fantastic <laughs> players. We have about four or five internationals in that development squad, you know, that will be good players. They will be good players. They may not all make it to our first team, but they're going to be good players, these guys. When they step up, they've had a little taste of it. They've seen me. They've had feedback from me in the game. So... I think that's a really important thing for this football club to do. Be proud of this, this academy that we have, you know. And uh, and I want, I, I can't wait to see a few more of these players going. I'm looking forward to Ryan Colley's first goal and seeing his celebration, you know, because uh, you know he's so noticeable and he's with his hair and that, you know, and you know sinks and and even Charlie Kelman who who's had a tough time under it, he's coming back in one of the best finishes on the training ground. So, listen, th these things are going to happen. Uh, and, and it's consistent behaviour from us, the coaching team, that, that will make it happen. So, appreciate your comment. Thanks for noticing the change. And go on. Thank you. Lovely. Thanks, Gareth. Okay, on to you. Next question. Just very quickly, just building on that positivity, um, apart from the first game, I think every game we've been unlucky. Uh, you referenced quite a lot. Do you know what? Yeah. <laughs> but obviously, Middlesbrough, Cardiff were great. You've referenced a lot about. I think you say in your interviews we're going to surprise a lot of people this season. Um, yeah. And I just want to know a bit more about what do you think that surprise will be, realistically? But the surprise, obviously, is that everyone has billed us as relegation fodder this season. Every, every magazine, every pundit, um, a lot of other teams, uh, whatever they think of. Um, as Lee alluded to, you know, um, budgets are important they're not absolutely everything but they will give you some some ver you know version of where you're going to be but and i think that that has come into play you know with with all the talk about the struggles of qpr this season and the pns and how we've got to be honest people have taken that and gone oh they 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 slipped away last season look at the end of the season they had a terrible end to the season we are going to surprise people believe me so when we're talking about this uh this this pns and the sustainability we, we're going to do this as well as finish higher than people thought in the league. So both of these things are going to happen. This is what I'm saying. It's not just going to be, wow, QPR bought their way out of this. Uh, they're going to go, wow, they've built their way out of this. They've built this way out of this. They, people have got us down for the bottom three without a shadow of a doubt. Okay. I, I am saying now, I firmly believe, I don't want to tell you what I've told the boys, but I've told them one thing where I think they can achieve. In this room, 
I don't think we're going to be anywhere near relegation fodder with the way we've been playing the last four games. I really think we've got something special going. And keeping everyone fit and keeping everyone healthy is going to be he's going to be key to this. But I believe in I believe in the staff, I believe in the players, and I believe in in this club. I mean, I'm not sure how much of a secret this is going to be in this room, considering it's being broadcast. I mean, <laughs> so really, <laughs> I haven't said anything wrong there. So <laughs> okay, on to the next question. Hi, uh, for Gareth, uh, just a couple of quick ones. Uh, first one: Why aren't we getting in the referee's face, Sunderland, the weekend? I mean, we sit up, we sit up in the upper loft. You see it away. You yeah. see all these players. I yeah. thought they were supposed to be cracking down on it, and it was a complete pee take on Saturday. Again, yeah, again, really frustrating for me because we tr we 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 try we try and do it right and not get in the referee's face. There's Leo, will tell you there's FA charges coming left, right, and centre. If you do that, we are really disappointed with the referee on Saturday. That the the sending off of Jack Colback, I I'm firmly saying from one angle it looks like a sending off, from another angle it doesn't. Whatever you're thinking of that is. What, what, one, what every angle shows is that eight Sunderland players ran to the referee and got in his face and surrounded him. And how that has not been picked up is just because there's a red card to a QPR player. They're not picking the rest of that up. And me and Lee have spoke about that today. We, we think that's, that's terrible. But we don't want to be the team that go telling tales, saying, oh, look at that, what happened there. We just hope there's a bit of consistency from these referees, you know. And, uh, and my players do care, but they're also <laughs> good characters as well, you know. And, and if that costs us... The odd, the odd game, then I'll take that, but we win more than we lose, I'll tell you that. Okay. Uh, the second one's yep. a bit tongue-in-cheek, really. Um, my grandson has now joined us on our three-and-a-half-hour round trip, my son and I, and uh, it's his second season, and uh, I noticed the fitness guy mentioned GPS in the back of the player. Yeah? Uh, yeah. Can they put in the postcode of the, s of the goal post so uh, we can see a few more goals down the loft end, please? <laughs> Listen, I, I firmly with you. Uh, there was a question I, I saw somewhere. Uh, somebody wanted to post the question saying we've only scored three and five. Well, get your facts right. We've scored six and six, all right? So we're not doing too bad. But I honestly believe that both Lyndon Dykes and Sinclair Armstrong will get double figures this season. I firmly believe both of those players. We've got Scotland's number nine, who's, who I feel for, as I said earlier, I think... The, his chances have been limited over the years. I think he's going to get double figures. And I think Sinclair w will be the next big asset of this place because I believe both of those players will get double figures for me this season. And maybe Ken Paul. I'm uh, only joking on that one. <laughs> I, I think the one we're all waiting for is Sinclair to score down that end because yeah. I think the place is going to go berserk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. I tell you, somebody told me about that, yeah. We never score at the loft, yeah, well, I might have to show him a, a videotape from Blackpool in 2003, all right, yeah? <laughs> okay, we've incredibly been going for already an hour and 40 minutes, so we'll just get through a couple of more questions, um, and then we'll move on to the raffle. Okay. Press this, do I? Oh, fine. Okay. Uh, this is for Rubin and Amit, really. Um, forgive me for saying it, but I wonder if you're being slightly economical with the truth when you talk about the uh, ongoing uh, helpful discussions with uh, the council, Ham Hammersmith and Fulham, where certainly from the outside looking in, uh, they don't appear to have helped in the ongoing search for a site. In fact, we've had the debacle with Old Oak Common We've had uh, Linford Christie, which I think now is a dead duck. Um, perhaps you could elaborate a bit more on the assistance you've had from them. As I say, uh, my impression is um, that they couldn't give a two hoots about us, frankly. Well, actually, that's not true. Um, we're not focused on looking for another site. I think that's where the difference is. So and we're not asking them to help us look for another site as a result of that. We're trying to see what we can do with this site and how we can actually make this site better. Um, and I, th I think one of the key things is not so much just adding more seats because we're not really filling it up anyway, right? So it's not about adding seats, it's about how you add more value from what we have here and make this venue actually more usable beyond 25 days a season. 
I mean, so I, I, 25 days in one year for a five-acre site in central London or, or west London actually is, is, is it's like a criminal, if you ask me. And I think that's where we're going to have more revenue coming from. A lot, a lot more revenue is what we're trying to drive here. I think that's the area they're trying to help us with, trying to see how we can make this site a lot better. So they have been very helpful, and I'm not being economical with the truth at all with, from that perspective. And in terms of helping us find another site, we've not been asking them to help us find another site. So, so it's not something we, we really need them to do. But in terms of how to make this site more um, beneficial to the club, that's where they've actually been trying to help us. I think we've had a problem in the past where on three occasions um, too much information got out at inappropriate times. And I don't think we're going to make that same mistake again. Okay, and next question. Uh, hi, gents. Um, just a question on how many transfer windows ahead we are planning in terms of departures. Uh, we've got two assets re who realistically, due to contract situations, and because of one's position in his national team and their likelihood to qualify for the European Championships, where we are realistically going to need to sell these two players in the next summer window. Um, just So just out of interest, how, how far ahead are we planning? Are we planning in terms of just to January or just to summer and beyond? And the second question I've got relates to the demographic of fans. Uh, Amit and Ruben, you, you're two big assets on this. You've mentioned as well that we've been a club that has existed 125 plus years. If we're going to exist for 125 more, the demographic of fans is going to have to change at some point to reflect the community that sits outside. And it's, it's a problem that, that multiple football clubs are having, particularly in London, is being able to attract the supporters who live in the flats opposite there, who live down Oxbridge Road, who, who, who aren't white and don't, re don't, don't tend to come to games. These people are going to be us, as a football club, going beyond that. Everyone in this, most people in this room, started coming to, to football at QPR because it was their local team and because it was accessible. Now we've got, we've got potential supporters outside in the community for whom it is their local team. And is the club, do they see the club as an accessible front for them? But the pair of you two are, are massive assets in this because there aren't many chairmen, there aren't many owners who look like you two, who can, who can get in touch with these, with these communities. Like, that, that's, that's probably a, a, a poor way of wording it, but there are there are benefits to be had here that that could make this this club more sustainable and, and continues it for another 125 years. I'd just like to address that second bit. By the way, uh, what you said is 100% accurate, and it's interesting that it's taken this forum to hear it because it may have only been about a couple of weeks ago where we paid quite a lot of money to these expensive consultants to teach us these things, and that was the finding that they came back with, is exactly what you've just said. And that is that, who is our fan base? Who's our local fan base? Are they represented today? And therefore, will they represent us tomorrow? And it's, an, it's a very astute observation, it's the right observation. As a matter of fact, I think the way you worded it is also correct, because it's hard hitting, and that's, that's the way it should be. The short answer to your question is, it's taken us longer than it should have, but it has been identified. Uh, and the shorter answer is that we have to do much more to engage with the community. The C QPR and the community trust, for example, I think that you would all agree is something that we're all very proud of. And it does wonderful work for the community in which it operates. But is the attendance at, the, at, at all of our home games, is it representative necessarily of your local club, I think you're right, it's not necessarily the case, or rather, let me say that other way, could it be done, could more be done, could we be doing a better job? Yes, you've identified it right, it is the case, we are aware of it, it's taken us longer than it should have, and there hopefully is a plan in place to address that. So I hope that eludes some of your concerns, not giving you too many answers. The reason I'm not giving answers is because we don't necessarily have one yet. Um, you're also correct, by the way, in that, you know, um, Maybe Ruben and I have a better chance of addressing it because of our ethnicity, et cetera, but that also is well represented in and around it. So it's a point actually very well made, and please be assured that it's something that is being well thought through at the board level. Uh, can I just add something else as well? I'd just like to thank the club for what they did for my dad on Saturday 
in uh, getting him to be able to meet Rodney Marsh. Um, he's flown over from the States, hasn't been to a game in five years. So I'd like to thank Andy and Chloe for the work they put in to make that happen. So thank you. Just a, a word on the demographics. There are a couple of things I wanted to do when I you know, first arrived. One of it was about lowering the, um, the average age of the, of, of the fan base. Um, so 10 years ago, the, the average age of a season ticket holder was 49. Average age of a season ticket holder today is 43.6. So we've been successful in that. And you must have been in my senior management team meetings this summer because one of the goals we had is, is we want to make sure the inside of the stadium is reflective of the community at large. So a couple of weeks ago, there was a, a, a meeting across multidisciplinary teams in, within, within our structure off the field in terms of coming up with a plan. So that is something that, is being, that will be rolled out shortly. OK, great. And we've got two more questions. OK. Uh, just a quick one. It's about Eze. Um, it was great when he played for England. And it might be confidential, but did we financially benefit from that? And also, if Eze gets sold for, say, 50 million, how much do we make? <laughs> you're, you're, Don't beat around the bush, really. You're, you're absolutely right. Um, it would be a breach of a confidentiality clause with it, within it. But um, what we need, we, I'm really um, supporting Eze to start the game. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. OK, very good. And one final question here. Before I ask my first my question, I just want to say thanks to the club for putting on an event like this, you know, to engage with the fans, giving us an opportunity to meet with all the big guys behind the scenes, you know, rather than the guys on the pitch as well. So I just want to say thank you for giving us the opportunity because it really, well, makes me proud to support the club, to be honest. It's brilliant. So. Um, and my question is basically... Uh, Gareth, you mentioned about the robustness of the players. Given the size of our squad and the, the challenges that the, the championship has with the number of fixtures, I mean, how difficult is it going to be, especially with your, your demands on the players, to give everything as well? A week like this where we've got, you know, we've had a game on Saturday, we've got tomorrow night, and we've got a game on Friday as well. I mean, how much of a challenge is it just to get players ready and just keep going for every game? Yeah, it's a great question, you know, and uh, the uh, the rotation of the of the squad will happen, I'm sure, this week. You know, I think you'll see um, a, a, a rotation in a few positions, without a doubt. Um, I, I believe in I believe in some of these young boys coming through. I think they're going to be key this season. I really do. Beli I, I honestly, believe me. I think we've got some cracking talent coming through, which are going to bolster. But I also think we've got a great 17, 18 players here. You know. Um, just to answer the, the question over there as well, the transfer window question we never got to. Um, we have lists in case of um, emergencies, serious long-term injuries or sales. We have lists, like extensive lists in our recruitment team of replacements. And, and so there is, there's, no, there's not going to be massive panic if somebody goes, we have lists, we have, we're working on this now. Uh, and how many transfer windows we, we work ahead. Um, sometimes it's best laid plans. We have extensive lists of all these players, but believe me, um, and Lee will verify this, sometimes you get a call off an agent, right player, right time, right price, and it's like you make your judgment then as well. So these things still happen in football, which is great. It's fairy tale stuff, you know, when you get these players in. But we do have extensive lists of just in case of long-term injuries, big injuries coming in, rotating the squad. But I, I've, I'm, I'm really... I'm really confident in the 16 17 i've got that i could play any combination obviously that means two or three or four would have to pay play all three games but we can get them by you know and uh, and i'm yeah I'm, I'm i'm so confident in the team i've got behind me and the team behind the players to keep them fit keep them robust um we we've got something special here this season and I'm, I'm i'm looking forward to that great stuff thanks very much and chloe's just going to bring forward the box with the raffles and Actually, in answer to your question earlier, where you were referencing your dad getting to meet Rodney Marsh, it was Chloe who organised that. So a nice round of applause for Chloe. Yay. OK, so just before we go to the raffle, we'll just have a final message from yourself, Amit, and yourself, Ruben, just in terms of how beneficial you have found this evening in terms of meeting supporters and answering the questions and 
perhaps explaining a few things as well. How beneficial is it? Yeah, uh, look, uh, uh, I think that the thing that I take away from today is this, that, that is that, you know, it's been, a, it's been a difficult sort of 12, 18 months. Maybe if you cast your eye back longer and if promotion is a longer term goal, then for a fan, the last several years may have been disappointing. It's however you view it. My, my view is that despite all of that, the gentleman in the back put his hand up and said, I've got two questions, but really, he said, I want to say two really positive comments to you guys. The gentleman in the corner said the same thing. You know, the gentleman here said, thanks for putting on a great... I mean, you guys could have used this forum to, um, to really be quite upset, to share a lot of frustrations. And by the way, whatever frustrations you share, as fans, we share them, them the same. And you could have you might well have used this forum in order to voice those. But instead, I think you've used this forum in order to, you know, thank and be and, and, and say positive things and encourage everybody around here. And for me, that is so telling of kind of what we have here at our football club. The largest attendances of last season was when the club needed them most. It was at the end of the season when we had to stay up. And we went back, and those are the highest attendances that we had all season, because that's the football club that we have. When we looked at season ticket sales going into the beginning of this season, we were worried, you know? Are people really going to renew season tickets because, like, it's been a tough time? Well, guess what? We had record renewal rates because that's when the fans know the club needs them the most. And for me, that is what is special about this football club. And coming back here and kind of f listening and fielding and... F frankly, talking to yourselves and understanding what the issues are, and frankly, trying to be honest in telling you where we stand from an FFP perspective, from a revenue perspective, etc. It's enormously useful, I think, to both parties. But my takeaway is that, in the way that you guys said it, and, and the gentleman here said it so succinctly, I'd like to thank you all so much for um, for your support of this football club, for always being there when the players need you. As Garrett says. You know, um, for that first half at, Su at Sunderland, Richard Riley, who I keep mentioning, but Richard sitting behind me, tapped me on the back. He goes, man, this is a great atmosphere. <laughs> 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 and I thought to myself, well, you haven't heard us uh, under lights on a Tuesday, cold Tuesday afternoon when we score. I mean, it can get pretty ruckus in here. And it's been fantastic. So I know things have been, been tough, but I just want you guys to know that from a board level and from everybody here, we're enormously grateful to you for, for, the, for the continued support, especially in difficult times. Um, and uh, I can't state um, more, more, more closely how much it is observed, noticed, and, and uh, how meaningful it is to everybody in the club. So thank you all very, very much. Obviously, I, I echo everything I said, and he's stolen everything I wanted to say as well. Uh, but but it, it, just to, to push that point further, I, I'm very surprised and about the way we've had our first two games this season. I think we have record attendances for the start of any season. I've been here for the last 12 years. And, and I think, again, it's like what Amit said. Everyone knows that this is going to be a tough year from a PNS perspective or FFP perspective. And everyone's trying to come out and help us as much as we can. And I think that's where you know the fans have really stepped up very in, in a very, very big way. And, and I'm very grateful and thank you for all of that. Um, the other thing I'm very grateful for is that if I, besides my wife, no one else has actually told me my looks are an asset. So, so thank you for that. <laughs> um, and, um, and please know that you know, we, we are trying as much as we can to be as transparent as we can and where we can. But, but as Lee said, sometimes being transparent can actually hurt us. And I think Gareth has said, you know, you know, being transparent about well, injuries can actually hurt us as well. So I think, you know, the club wants to be as transparent as we can. And if there are times where it seems we're not, we actually need to be not transparent at that time because it's actually for the betterment of the club overall. So th thank you everybody for coming as well tonight. Thank you. Great stuff. Thanks very much. Okay, so first up, I'll come to you, Amit. So we've got, this is for a signed ball. And then the winner can receive it from Gareth, if that's okay. And the winner is Catherine Hilton.
Brilliant. Congratulations, Catherine and Ruben. I'll make my way to you. Karen Hampshire. Karen Hampshire. And Karen, you have won. I should really have said this beforehand for the excitement, but you have won Corner Lounge Hospitality for two to a game of your choice. Many congratulations. Okay, and we'll just have a very final message just to let you know that the bar will reopen um, for a quick drink afterwards. Thanks very much for coming, and we'll come to Gareth for the final message of the evening. Well, short of just shouting you are, uh, which might go down well, I just want to say thank you for your patience. Um, thank you very much for your patience because it's been uh, a real roller coaster of six months, really has, and I've had to change a hell of a lot. Um, to, to manage the way I, I wanted to manage and the way I saw the club uh, going forward. I've had some amazing times here, amazing times, both as a player and a manager. Um, and Burnley away last year will be one of my finest ever moments as a manager, you know, and, and, and then doing it at Stoke. It was just incredible to, to have that knowledge that, you know, I've got great people behind me. Um, as Amit said, I was a tiny bit anxious tonight. I thought like there may be some, there may be some, you know, some not abuse, but some uh, tough questions and some some serious, uh, you know, what we're doing, why we're playing, why why that, why that. I think all of you understand, and I think that's spreading throughout the whole football club. And I, I really appreciate your support. I aim to achieve at this club and achieve big, and success at the moment might not just be Premier League right now. But believe me, my eyes are on there, right in the distance, and that's what I want for this football club. Thank you all for your support, and hopefully we can do it together. Great stuff. Thanks very much for joining us this evening. Thanks for watching on the stream, and the bar is now open. Thank you.